Some of you will know the name Frank Abagnale. He was the con man's con man. He assumed all kinds of roles and all kinds of professions, none of which he was qualified for. But he just had a way. He, he successfully posed as a doctor, as an airline pilot, and as a lawyer, all bogus. I, I'm not quite sure how he got out of some of that stuff, but he managed to, to uh, counterfeit his way into a very successful and illustrious career. He had no formal training or education in any of these areas. He was just a really good imposter. He was caught and escaped several times, but he was eventually imprisoned uh, for what he had done in a federal corrections facility. He spent 12 years there. And then he got a job uh, with the government, helping to identify people like himself. <laughs> And uh, today, he helps big companies identify security breaches so that they can avoid being bamboozled from more people like Frank Abagnale. In 2002, a movie was made of his life uh, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, and it's called Catch Me If You Can. Now, Abagnale passed himself along as something he wasn't, and he hurt a lot of people uh, in the process. He looked authentic on the surface, but underneath he was counterfeit. Maybe you've been the victim of a con man. Uh, maybe you have a hard time even now discerning the genuine from the fake. That's kind of the subject of this series that we're now in the third week of. How do you know who to believe? How are we supposed to know who to believe? Well, the Apostle John wrote a letter to the churches in the area in which he lived, Ephesus, which would be western Turkey today. And he was an old man, and he was writing because there were some factions that had removed themselves from the early church that were teaching things that were totally different. And a lot of the, the Christians, the young Christians, I mean, this was the very beginning of the church, right? Um, were, were confused. What should I do? And John, uh, being an old man and probably understanding that he must be getting toward the end of his life, he's the only one of the apostles to die a natural death, thought, you know what, I better set the record straight. And we talked in the last few weeks about this, how John, I mean, he was the last surviving apostle, the last surviving uh, one who walked with Jesus in his earthly ministry. He saw the miracles, didn't he? He was part of the dynamic trio, Peter, James, and John. That, that Jesus seemed to call them for specific things. And uh, he could attest to uh, the authenticity of Jesus. And he was helping these young believers to be on guard against false teachers, uh, counterfeit Christians, you know, who, who talk one way and live another. And it's interesting as we've gone through, we're starting through uh, the letter of 1 John, uh, how many parallels we can draw today. And also with the caution, of course, that not everybody is out to get you. Not everybody is a false teacher. The people that troll uh, Facebook and YouTube seem to understand who's a false teacher because it's basically anyone who doesn't believe like they do. Determining what's false and what's real doesn't give us the right to become critics. Amen. But the Bible has a lot to say about how to recognize the true from the false, especially this letter of 1 John. So the, the group that had splintered and, and left this early church, they claimed to be Christian, but they claimed a secret hidden knowledge. Uh, the Greek word for knowledge is uh, Gnoso, and, and that's where we get the word Gnostic. We let the G off of there. Um, Gnostic, and, and it, it means to know, but in this case, it was a, I'm superior to you because I understand more about Jesus than you do. And meanwhile, here's John who says, um, excuse me, <laughs> um, I've got some credentials you, you may want to know about. And so because the early church fathers attributed this letter to John. 
uh, we know that this is authentic and we can trust what it says. So, I mean, who would you rather talk to? Someone who thinks they know or someone who knows? Someone who knows, right? So, the, this group, the Gnostics, um, uh, although they weren't called that then, but they, they denied that Jesus was that hard to understand 200%. They denied his physical nature, that he was all spirit. And, and because of that, they denied that he physically died and that he physically rose again. Their thinking was that anything that is physical is evil. Uh, it doesn't amount to anything. So uh, how could God become physical, right? A lot of them, it also gave them an excuse to live any way they wanted, because if it was all spiritual and the physical didn't matter, well, then you could uh, do things in the physical that the Bible speaks against, but somehow they felt they were above that. So, you can imagine the doors that that opens, you know, sexual immorality, all kinds of things. It doesn't really matter what you do with your body, but it does matter what you do with your body, because we are created in the image of God. Jesus, the Son, who was eternally existent with the Father, became a man at the time of his incarnation. If Jesus, you've heard me say this all the time, and I'm going to keep saying it just to make sure you get it. If Jesus did not walk in a human body, if he was not subject to all of the temptation that we are, his death would have meant nothing. He had to be a flesh and blood human being, and he had to live above sin. That's why what the Bible calls propitiation. That's a 10-cent word that means he had the currency necessary to pay your bill for our sin. So here's John, now an old man, telling the early Christians, listen, I was there. I walked with him. I, I was part of his team. Uh, I saw the miraculous. I, and, and think about on, uh, on Pentecost, you know, that we read right away in chapter 3, the man sitting at the gate, Peter and John, said, what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And that man, lame from birth, rose up and walked. Think about all the things that these men saw. And here's the last living representative of this team that traveled with Jesus. And John is saying, listen, I can most certainly uh, ascertain that he was fully human as well as fully God. And perhaps John's gospel uh, does the best at explaining that, that he was fully God in addition to being fully human. When we consider that the Gospel of John, the three letters of John, and the book of Revelation were likely written around the same time toward the end of the first century, we know that he's getting old. He wants to get this recorded so that people in the future are going to have the benefit of this genuine knowledge. Last week, we looked at chapter 1 of 1 John. The key verse for that whole thing is God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And we said, look, is, is what you're walking in, is what you're teaching, is what you're believing, will it stand the, trust, the test of pure light? And, and that's how we have to understand. If, if, if He is the light and we're walking in the light, that way we stay true to Him and we're not going to be tempted to, to veer off. And so when we came out of last Sunday, we said, make sure to stay in the light. Well, today we're going to look at 1 John 2. Now, as we go through this whole book of 1 John, we're not taking every verse, but I encourage you to read it. Uh, some of you, hopefully. Anybody reading 1 John right now? Yep, good. So keep doing that. The rest of you can catch up. I won't keep track. Uh, <laughs> John here continues to share his heart with these young Christians to instruct them how to identify the false and to stay in the truth, the genuine versus the counterfeit, right? The real versus the fake, the authentic versus the phony. So, uh, you know, I take the biblical example of Ephesians 4 uh, very seriously. Uh, verses 11 through 13, Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith 
and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Describing the, the ministry gifts to the church. Not all of them have reverend in front of their name. Not all of them are ordained. But God equips people to that. Why? So that we all grow to maturity. So if we're going to recognize the true from the false, we have to be mature believers in Christ. Right? So together we grow up. I love that. We don't jump from one belief to another. We don't go on the, the latest fad, but we grow up as the body of Christ, as uh, Christ is the head of that body, of course. It's not enough just to know the counterfeit. You yourself have to be genuine in your walk with Christ. It's not enough to know about, right? It's not enough to know about. You can be a seminary professor and know all about the Bible and not know the God of the Bible. You can be a church member and have very good biblical recall, but not know the God of the Bible. We don't, we reverence the Bible, we don't worship it, right? We worship the God of the Bible. All right. That's right, Pastor. You got it. All right. I know this is going to surprise you, uh, this critical culture in which we live, but you can be against something without ever being for anything. I want you to be for something. I want you to be for Jesus. So today we're going to look at chapter 2 out of 1 John. It'll give us some good definitions of authentic Christianity. And uh, as we look at the genuine, well then, the counterfeit is also going to rise to the surface. I came up with four ways, based on these passages we're going to look at today, four ways that we could determine, first of all, if we are living in the truth. Second of all, if the teaching of others is authentic or counterfeit. Four passages from 1 John 2. And here's the first. Uh, looking at verses 3 to 6, and they'll be on your screen. And I encourage you always, though, to have yours with you, whether it's paper or it looks like this. It's good to know how to get to the address, right? Uh, 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys His word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must live in as Jesus did. <laughs> if, if you're in Christ, your heart's desire will be to obey Him and honor Him. Amen. There's a, a desire to keep those rules, stay with me on this, to keep the rules that you've never been able to keep because you were trying to keep rules instead of having a relationship with Jesus. We're not saved by keeping rules. But when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you, suddenly our heart changes. And now, we, it doesn't mean that we are sinless, but we have a desire to do what pleases God. Because the law has gone from being written on tablets of stone to being written on tablets of heart, mm -hmm. human heart. Your, your heart's desire is to honor Him. And when we do mess up and when we do fall, there's a, an understanding that, no, I've got to get back, right? right? This is the, the new man, the new woman, the changed person, the transformed life. So if you're in Christ, you're bent, if you're going to have a bent in your life, it's going to be toward following the rules, even though the rules are not saving you. Does that make sense? Can you identify with this? Rule keeping isn't the goal. Knowing Christ is the goal. Amen. It's more than words on a page, right? It's the one whom the words describe. That's the authentic, that's the genuine. What about the counterfeit? Well, I think it's interesting in this first passage of Scripture that it says no four times, it uses that word no. And it's very interesting that this group that pulled away talked about their superior hidden secret knowledge. And John is kind of rubbing their nose in it. <laughs> Let me tell you something about knowing, right? These false teachers 
were big on knowledge, and they claimed this secret wisdom from God. But John is writing here, whoever says, I know him, but doesn't do what he commands is a liar. Today, we'd call that cheap grace. I said some sinner's prayer, which appears nowhere in Scripture. I said some sinner's prayer, maybe even became a member of a church, but I don't know Jesus. John says, whoever says, I know him, but doesn't do what he commands is a liar. He's, he's telling them that, look, your secret wisdom is not from God. Right. It's false. The false teachers threw out obedience and claimed grace. It doesn't matter how I live. And thank God for His grace, huh? Yes. It's only by grace that we have hope of, of a new life. It's only by grace that we avoid what we deserve, hell, right. and, and receive eternal life in His presence in heaven. It's only by grace. Amen. But but you can't throw out obedience and just say, well, I'm under grace, and it doesn't matter how I live. If there's no change, you, you can't say you're born again. No different from the world. You just go to church on Sunday, maybe. If there's no fruit from your life, it's just lip service, right? And we know how cheap talk is. It gets cheaper and cheaper all the time. Today, what, what can this tell us? If you know the authentic, you'll spot the counterfeit. You don't have to struggle and worry and, and be afraid to leave your house that someone's going to trick you if you know the real deal. You'll spot the counterfeit right away. Here's a second way that we can know authentic from counterfeit. Let's look at verses 10 through 11. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. And there is nothing in them to make them stumble. Stumble, But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I don't know, and I'm not asking for a raised uh, hand here. I wonder if anyone maybe has a, would have a testimony of saying, you know, I just didn't know where I was going. I just walked here for a while, and that didn't work. So I tried this for a while, and that didn't work. It's common to the human animal. we just got to do it ourselves. If I can just do this, if I can just do that, if I can just find the right spouse, if I can just get the right job, and we just keep on wandering aimlessly when all along we're designed to walk in the light, <laughs> the true light that comes from heaven. And, and, and John is telling these Christians, if you're in that light, if you live there, you will love your fellow believer. You will love your fellow believer. Are there personalities that may grate you the wrong way? Maybe. But that doesn't mean you can't love them. And, and John wrote a lot about love, didn't he? The love of God. That it was love that sent Jesus. That for God so loved the world, huh? That he gave his only son. What does it look like then to love your fellow believer? Well, you consider their needs above your own. It's selfless, not selfish. And, and man, does our world need to see some selflessness. Oh, my goodness, the idolatry of self is at an all-time high. It's, it's what works for me. Even people who will deny that Jesus is the only way, well, that works for you. Doesn't work for me. What can I get out of it? Where loving your fellow believer is about giving to them whatever that may be. Consider their needs above your own. And you know what? If you do that, then someone else has got you covered. <laughs> and, and our motivations are pure because we're walking in the light. We got to see people the way God sees them. You don't know what that person has been through. Amen. You don't know what something has done to them. Amen. A lot of people have been hurt in church. 
And if you're not walking in the light, you'll think that's what God's all about. You got to walk in the light. Get with people who know Jesus. Understand what happened to you that had nothing to do with God. Walk in the light and you'll recognize that right away. When we love one another, we care for them. We want what's best for them. The golden rule, right? We were taught that in kindergarten. Still not a bad rule for us to live by. Most importantly, never do anything that would cause them to stumble spiritually. And that's exactly what these false teachers were doing in John's day. They were trying to lead others astray. Because if they could do that, then it would kind of verify, uh, validate maybe themselves. They were looking for other people to validate their perceived uh, superior intellect. They were walking in their own light. When you walk in your own light, sometimes you can become a stumbling block for other people. And also being understanding of others. Sometimes a stumbling block is not necessarily sin. Sometimes a stumbling block to somebody else, you may have liberty. Let me give you an example before the people start saying he thinks that sin isn't sin. If you are on a fast and someone tries to convince you, well, that's silly, you should eat. It's not wrong for them to eat, but it is for you, right? right? There are other things that, that some, some very uh, sincere believers in Christ may, may not have a problem with. I mean, it used to be that um, you didn't even want to have anything uh, overly stimulating on Sunday, Right? That's where ice cream sundaes came from. (laughs) I'm serious. Because because carbonated drinks were too worldly for a sundae. Yeah. It's not the Bible, but people acted like it was. So if someone doesn't have a problem with drinking a Coke on a sundae, and somebody does, don't, don't make it a stumbling block for them. Just be considerate of one another, right? Yeah. How about a calling to ministry? A lot of people don't understand a calling to ministry. Why would you want to go and do that? Can't you make more money doing this? Why would you want to be on call 24 hours a day? Why would you want to? But you understand the call, and you discern the call, right? You have people today that try to talk you out of doing what's right. (laughs) They don't love you if they're trying to cause you to sin. Misery loves company. Some people don't like it when you get free of misery. They prefer it when you're miserable with them. But in the church, that should never be. We will be known as the genuine article by our love for one another. Here's a third way to distinguish authentic from counterfeit. Verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. What does it mean to love the world? Well, let's try this. To have longing or fascination for the very things that God called you out of. When when He sanctified you initially at salvation, and he, he called you out, right? To be sanctified means to be set apart for a purpose. So, there, there are some things that we turned our back on, 
And we say the world, it doesn't mean that the world is all evil. There's wonderful things in the world. There's, there's uh, events we can do, and there's all kinds of fun activities. It's, it's not saying that anything fun is wrong. It's saying that worldly meaning carnal, meaning of the flesh. The things that drive people who have not been changed into new creations. And a lot of times the thing that God called us out of when we were first saved and we were first born again can become an allure because, well, that was kind of fun for a while. I, there was a guy one time that got up and gave a testimony about how for a long time he wasn't living for Jesus. He was just drinking and smoking and just having a good time. <laughs> and he didn't realize what he was saying, you know. But there's an element of fun to that, right? If it's temporary and it's fleeting. But the flesh wants what the flesh wants, and the flesh will do what it has to do to get it. And if we have this longing or fascination for things that God has called us out of, well, then we need to get back on track. Sometimes you get a little too excited about your testimony. <laughs> you think about that for a minute. Remember the good old days when I could sin and didn't bother me at all? The world system is against God because it's a man's system. If your hopes and dreams and aspirations line up more with that system than God's, you have reason to be concerned about your spiritual condition. Talk about lust of the flesh. The flesh wants what the flesh wants. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You know, when we think about lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes, it's, we, we think of a sexual thing, and that's true, but it, the idea that you want, what, you want what you can't have, right? But it's not just that. It could be power. It could be control. It could be wealth at any cost. It could be fame. It could be one. I, I want someone to take a look at me for a change. And, and that can get us really in the wrong position, right? You can want what other people have, right? The house, the boat, the car, the spouse, <laughs> whatever it may be. And when we do that, we get ourselves in trouble. And ministry envy, that's a thing. Wish I had that church. Wish people liked me like they liked that person. Wow, look at their house. Even aside from the carnal things, there can be ministry envy that we look at somebody else and we see fruit for the kingdom and we get jealous. It's, it's, it's pride. It's pride of life. Pride of life, by the way, means boasting, right? But it can also mean the total opposite. It's all idolatry. And the idol is self. If you're, if you're overly proud of you and you want people to say things about you, it can also be the exact opposite of that. It can be your misery. It, it can be your depression. It can be your self-abasement. That can become an idol because you find your identity in what you're not. It's not the way God made us to be. I had a, a friend in ministry who used to come over this line. He said, sometimes our human nature, though, we get thinking that we're all that, you know. And we say, God, with my plan and your power, man, we could really go places. <laughs> we don't get to use God for our own plans, right? But here are false teachers were doing just that. I'm smarter than you. I'm closer to God than you. I have more wisdom than you. And it caused them to look down their hyper-spiritual noses at everybody else. Now we can see some of the same thing. There's a, a knowledge. Well, I used to believe in Jesus, but I've discovered that there are more ways. Uh, and, and the attitude is, I'm so much smarter than you stupid, simple people. But, you know, there comes a time when your wisdom doesn't get you through. And there will come a time, eventually, at the end of this life, where that wisdom just won't cut it. And we have 
the testimony of, in this case, Apostle John, who saw with his own eyes, who believed with his whole heart, who, who understood that Jesus was the only way, not just for the Jew, but for the Gentile. Here's a man who's getting into his later years, and he's saying, I want to get this written down so people don't get led astray. There are people through the last 2,000 years of church history that have given everything for the cause of Christ. And someone comes along and has one college class under their belt and decides they're smarter than all of them. You see how fickle that wisdom is? It's all motivated inward. It says, look at me. And if you're in Christ and walking in the light, you won't be saying, look at me. John says here, that kind of attitude, that smarter than you attitude, that doesn't come from God, but it comes from the world. And if you want to live in the world, that's your right. But you can't claim to follow Jesus and live in the world. All right. So let's look at the fourth way. Verses 22 to 23. The fourth way to distinguish authentic from counterfeit. Uh, Starting at 22. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. This is denying Christ. And that's what these false teachers were doing in the first century. They were denying the legitimacy of Christ, that the the Son of God God in the flesh, right? That's what we we refer to the Trinity as one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. When Jesus walked on the earth, the Holy Spirit and the Father still existed, right? Uh, When Jesus left, he said, it's good for you that I go away. I send another comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. When we sense his presence today, like we did uh, during the service today, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the way that we know and understand God in in this age of the church. When he says, Antichrist, Antichrist, uh, we're used to hearing that term as the the one who will deceive many at the end of all things. But this is Antichrist, notice it's small a, uh, for our understanding. It means against Christ. It means another Christ. It can mean opponent or adversary of Christ. And what he's saying is that anyone who does what he's saying, who denies that Jesus is the Christ, they are anti-Christ. They're actually showing another Christ because they're saying, follow me, because I'm smarter than all of you people. It's interesting that today, (laughs) well, back here, These false teachers were saying that Jesus was only spiritual and not physical. Today it's the other way around. Today most people will acknowledge the physical Jesus, but deny his divinity. It takes both. It's both. Jesus is both. And too many times people have tried to reduce Jesus to somebody that in their minds they could control or manipulate. And he is so far beyond anything that we could come up with. Verse 23 says, if you deny the Son, you have no claim to the Father. If you acknowledge the Son, you have the Father, or you're in the Father. I think that is so cool. That without him we are nothing, but still God cannot wait to just let us in on the secrets of heaven. That God can't wait to bless us in our lives. As we go. He can't wait to give us what we need. He just can't wait to equip his followers with giftings that enable them to serve and bless others beyond anything they ever imagined they could do. But yet all we have to do is just come to the end of our own selves and trust in who Christ is. It's just so much there, folks. There's just so much. I said it earlier in the service today, and I don't think that I have achieved it all. I'm, I'm including myself. There is so much more available in our experience in Christ than any of us has ever even approached. There's so much there. And, and we let so many things going on in this world distract us from that. Even 
getting to a point where we think that everybody's a false teacher, it's all over, I guess I'll just go home. We don't see that anywhere in the Word of God that we're supposed to just kind of sit back and coast and wait for the rapture. It's not there. I don't want to go down any more rabbit trails, but listen. If we deny that Jesus is who He said He is, then He died for nothing. And the cross means nothing. The shed blood means nothing. We can't claim to follow Jesus and not acknowledge Him to be the Christ. Verses 26 and 27 says, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from Him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in Him. As for you, what if he's writing that to us today? And this is the living word of God, and I believe this is written to us today. Mm-hmm. As for you, as for you, remember the anointing you receive. What does that mean? Well, I believe it means the Holy Spirit. Yes. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. You cannot be transformed without the Holy Spirit, right? So, as that anointing has rested on you, walk in that. And then there's more, right? There's special endowments. There's the charisms and the grace gifts and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When we say, Lord, I want you to fill me to overflow. And and we should be seeking to, to, to be full of the Holy Spirit, whether for the first time or in subsequent times. Because listen, you can be filled to overflowing one day and you can leak some of it out the next, right? We come back and be always with an attitude of, Lord, I want everything you have for me and everything you have for me to do. And then verse 27 says, you do not need anyone to teach you. It doesn't mean we get to make it up as we go along. <laughs> uh, it, 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 that would discount any human teachers, and that would disqualify John from even writing this letter. That doesn't mean that we don't need teachers and that the Word doesn't teach us and that there's no value in human teachers. But what it meant for the Christians in John's day, we have to understand that first. It meant for them, you don't need all this secret knowledge that all these people are trying to get you to believe because that's not real, that's false. You need the knowledge you already have, and that is who Jesus is and what He's done for you. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate that. You can trust the Holy Spirit. (laughs) That anointing is real. It's not counterfeit. Today, are we not bombarded by a lot of voices? We are bombarded by voices of many teachers who claim to walk in the light of God. And, And what I have found is that many of these teachers that get a lot of press, most of them are very, very good. But they also bring along people who are always looking out to to label somebody as a false teacher. Don't fall for that garbage. Don't. We get, we get some comments in our online stuff that make, make me sad. There are lots of armchair theologians. And I, I pray for them. Generally, the people who withdraw from anything to do with church life for the most critical. And, I, and really what it is, is they're trying to base things on their own wisdom and knowledge. But listen, just because, I said it before, just because some, someone is different doesn't make them a false teacher. Just because their call to ministry is different than yours doesn't make them a false teacher. But to stay in Christ We don't have to fret over who's false and who's not. We'll know. You'll know. It's not like false teachers for dummies, right? There's no cliff notes for this. You have to experience Jesus and walk in the light, and you won't have any trouble discerning the true from the false. Many years ago, everybody taught about the second coming. Every sermon you heard was about the second coming of Christ. 
And there's nothing wrong with sermons about the second coming of Christ, but it got to a point where in some circles, that's all they ever talked about, to the extent of forsaking the preaching of the gospel. A lot of people are really excited about end times, and there's as many different opinions as you can imagine. Because we're all kind of postulating, aren't we? He hasn't returned yet. We don't know every little detail about it. Revelation is rather cryptic. Daniel is rather cryptic. It doesn't mean that we don't read it and study it. But you can be so focused on one area of theology or doctrine that you forget the gospel. And the gospel is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if you're faithful and just, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The gospel is good news. There is a Savior, and he loves you. Varieties in teaching doesn't necessarily mean uh, false teaching. But here in chapter 2 of 1 John, we do have four tests of authenticity. And I'd like, I'd like for you to just kind of get your eyes on it. You might want to write these down. Four t- tests of authenticity to determine whether what is authentic and what is counterfeit. And the first thing we have to do is determine whether we are living up to these four litmus tests. And the first one is this, keep His commands. As believers in Jesus Christ, our heart should be to keep His commands. Um, are we always going to do that? No. no, thank you. One honest person. <laughs> We're going to have moments when we stumble. We're going to have moments when we fall. But our heart's desire should be to keep His commands. The second one is this, love your fellow believer. This is a, everyone says they have a friendly church, but this is a really friendly church, you know. Amen. And you act like you really act, want to be here and, and like you love one another. And, I, and that's awesome. It's a great testimony. If, if, you, if you are of an attitude that you just cannot stand to be around other people, uh, some people say, I don't need the church. Well, guess what? You're not really following the commands of Jesus because we need one another Amen. and we should love one another. The third one, not in love with the world. Ask it of yourself and ask it of those who are teaching and trying to convince you of things. Is there too much of a love for the things of the world? Are we too captivated? Uh, Sometimes by the very things that God delivered us from and called us out of. And four, believe that Jesus is the Christ, that He is who He says He is. You, You find yourself walking far off of that, you need to do some business with God. Make sure you've had a genuine experience with Jesus and you are continuing to have a genuine experience with Jesus, that you're truly born again, that you have repented and are turning the other way, that you've said no to your past life and yes to what God has for you, Uh, that you're not trying to walk with one foot in the grave and one foot in heaven as if that were possible. John chapter 1 verse 5 says God is light and Him is no darkness at all. We can't walk in the darkness and claim to follow Jesus. And today, if you can say that you're genuinely living your life with these four tests of authenticity in in your sights, at the center of your heart's desire to keep His commands, to love your fellow believers, uh, to not be so much in love with the world and believe that Jesus is who He says He is, well then, you are on the right track to walking in the light. You know, one of these things struck out, stuck out at me today. And it's what I want to kind of wrap this up with, and I want to ask you some questions. And I want to ask you to be honest. And that's number three. Number three. You know, churches in the, in the holiness or the Pentecostal tradition, as, as such as our roots are, sometimes have made the mistake of making a lot of rules of what you can't do. And they missed the whole idea of what you can and should. And it was kind of a man-made effort to make the guardrails and bumpers into doctrine. Uh, There was a time in our tribe that you'd never go to see a movie. But then when you can watch them at home, suddenly they became okay. 
There was even a time back when television first came out that they called the, the antenna, some of you don't know what an antenna is, but an antennas, they called them the devil's horns, and they called it television until they could afford one. <laughs> and that we could say, going down through the years, the internet, all this stuff, it's of the devil. And, and, we've, and I think maybe with really good intentions have, have turned this into a works thing, what you don't do. And that's not good. But I think we can get too far the other way. And, and we can say, you know what, it doesn't matter. Jesus is my Savior. I'm living by grace. And uh, I'm free. I'll just go do whatever I want. And, and it gets to a point where you have to ask, are you really walking in the light? There are also things that the world attracts us to that are not sinful in and of themselves. But maybe for us, we're spending too much time there. Could it be that there is something that God would choose to illuminate today that you need to say, nah, I don't think so. Maybe it's something that's taking too much of your time. Maybe it's Maybe it's turn off the news. Finances. What are you putting your money into? Nothing wrong with having nice things. But what do you think could be done if that money was invested in the kingdom of God? It doesn't have to be at first assembly, but we'll take it too. How about something that you just say, well, I just don't think I could ever, it's something I've always done. I've always done this. Uh, I've, I've always... Let me tell you something about, from the time I was three years old, not that I remember, I sang. And I've sung every day of my life since I was three. And I did it professionally for a while. And, and I love music, and I love leading here and singing here. But, but there was a time that I came to a crossroads in my life, and I said, what's more important, ministry or this kind of ministry? And I said, it's time. Put it aside and do something that I never thought I'd do, and that's pastor. Well, let me say it the other way. I always kind of thought I would, but I didn't want to. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know a lot of pastors, and I've seen what they go through. So it wasn't wrong for me to do most of my ministry through music, but it came to a point where it was time to set it aside. So not everything that you walk away from is evil or sinful, but there are seasons in our lives. Is God calling you today into something an area of service, an area of giving, an area of focus, that you have to say, you know what, I'm too much in love with the world, and I need to, to let that go. I want to challenge you today. If there's an attraction that is pulling you more than spending time in his presence, or, or getting to know him more, or experiencing the, the deep riches of the knowledge of Christ. If there's something that's pulling you from that and you say, you know what, I probably could go deeper if it wasn't for this. Consider losing this. Because, listen, there are people every day that are lost in need of a Savior. There are people in your family, in your circle of friends that need Jesus. God is creative, and he will give us creativity in how we present this gospel message to a world that is increasingly far from him. They're worshiping themselves. They're worshiping man-made things. And church, I think it may be time for us to consecrate ourselves anew, to put aside the attractions of the world to get serious with God.
Let me tell you something. I know, like the old preachers used to say, and I laughed at them, but now I say it, I know that I know that I know that I know that there's more. It's right here. It's right here. There's more. There's more. And I want to get right where that more is. And then when I do that, I'm going to go, there's more. There's more. 